Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Neosystems CMMC Town Hall. Now I'd like to introduce your host, Ed Bassett from Neosystems. Ed? Hi, thanks, Don, and welcome, everyone, to our continuing series of Town Hall Ask Me Anything sessions on the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. Uh, my guest today is Katie Arrington. I uh, want to mention to the audience that we are recording these sessions as part of our community outreach to the defense industrial base. Our focus as a managed service provider is on organizations seeking certification. That's primarily who we have in our audience today. If you do have some questions for, for Katie during the session, please send them in the Q&A window, and I will work as many of those questions in as, as uh, time will allow. Um, I'll start with an introduction of, of, of Katie. She may not need an introduction to this audience, but uh, Katie is the Chief Information Security Officer in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. She leads the CMMC effort for the DOD and has been a very effective change agent for this far-reaching program, which really has promised to do nothing less than reinvent the role of cybersecurity in DOD buying decisions. Katie, thanks for joining us today. No problem. Thank you for having me again, Ed. <laughs> well, thanks I for being here. Yeah. Right the last time you were here was our was your your last presentation before the holidays. So hopefully it, it set off a good uh, vacation for you there. Yes. No, it was good. Good, good, good. All all ready to be back. Woohoo! Now we're back. We're back in action. Back in the seats. Our our audience today mostly, as I mentioned, organizations seeking certification. Um, you know, all these folks are tracking CMC really closely. So for the most part, we've all heard the basics of CMC, why we're doing it, how it's structured. Um, the contractors, certainly those in our highly engaged audience, right, they've already started taking steps towards certification. These are the folks who want to do the right thing and be at the, at the front of the pack. So today we're hoping you can share kind of the latest news, address some questions on the best ways to succeed on the, the CMMC journey. Sure. So mm -hmm. let's start with a little bit of how the world is changing. We've had an earth-shaking supply chain hack with solar winds, uh, taking them out by foreign adversaries. Uh, we have a new administration moving in with new priorities around cyber. We've got a pandemic that's really causing a real change in workforce management, IT practices. How do those things affect our cyber posture and specifically, I guess, CMC vision? Is it is it changing because of these things? It's accelerating it. I, I can't, it's, yeah. <laughs> with you have an event like Solar Winds. You just can't stress enough <laughs> how fast we need to get this implemented. Um, and once again, you know, for those people, uh, before we came on, Ed and I were talking um, that it's, you know, nothing is perfect um, in this world and nothing is 100% secure. But what you do in your daily activities is you do, you do your best to buy down the risk and buy up the uncertainty that the adversary can, can get access. Um, with solar winds, um, CMMC level four and five uh, are the, the critical thinking skills to create a zero trust environment, but having a CMMC certification wouldn't have prevented solar winds from happening. That's, you know, you have to understand the difference. Um, so, but, it has once again, you know, I keep saying it's just like it's getting beaten into us. This is the new way we have to look at things from COVID um, to solar winds to everything going on. So it's only accelerated it. Um, and, you know, as I said prior to uh, any of this, this is a bipartisan effort. Um, I, I love the, the, you know, the trying to politicize this. This is not a political issue, has never been a political issue. In fact, uh, most of the effort for uh, the, the CMMC, you know, came from the Hask. Um, I cannot say enough positive things about Representative Langevin, uh, Representative Smith, uh, Representative Wilson, um, all on the Hask, all knew this was a critical uh, thing. And on the SASC side, the Senate Armed Services Committee, you know, centered around this in Senator Manchin, and now they, you know, they, they flip-flopped but still bipartisan. This really is about national defense. So the, the yeah, the world's changing fast. And I mean, the pandemic and solar winds, those two things have shown us how quickly things can change in ways that, you know, we didn't necessarily anticipate or, or see coming. Not that, not that nobody knew there was a possibility of a pandemic, not that nobody knew there was a possibility of a supply chain hack of that magnitude, but when it happens, how fast things change is, is pretty remarkable. And I think, you know, the, the, 
the IT part of our world changes fast too. Technology evolves. So just want to think about that in the context of the CMMC standard. It was published a year ago. Companies are going to start to be certified under that standard this year. Those certifications are good for three years. So even for those earliest adopters, that standard is going to be five years old before their second audit, right? So thinking about it in that context. Our defenses need to keep pace with the speed at which the technology is changing. So an audience member sent in a question, so I'll use this to kind of spin this, this question a little bit. The audience member question was about voice over IP, and they said, hey, we've, we're using Microsoft Teams. We don't have a VoIP system, so is that requirement in CMMC not applicable? And you know, my reaction was, well, I don't know. And Microsoft Teams seems like voice, and it uses IP, so maybe it is voice over IP. I don't know. But that's just an example, I guess, of how you know the wording and the requirements gets dated just as we, we progress down the, the technology path. Um, restrictions on remote access, right? So, you know, if you're working remote and everything you access is in the cloud, is there really a notion of remote access to a corporate network? Less and less people are, are doing it. So I guess my question for you is how does CMMC handle that pace of change in the world, technological change, so that our practices stay ahead of the adversaries? So I won't say it's easy, right? Because nothing worth obtaining in this life is easy. So it is complicated. Um, we meet, uh, you know, the, the CIO, I have a peer, um, an equal in CIO. He's the, uh, the deputy on uh, cyber, Dave McEwen. Uh, Kevin Delaney is the other CIO entity that I interface with um, as much as I do my own team. Because as these things come up, we need to stop, we need to look, we need to think, A, what is the result we're trying to get to, right? It, you know, are we going to get hung up on things, uh, you, you know, there's one out there and I joke, I don't, I say this with no disrespect, it's called a Grillit app. And it runs on some large primes. Now it runs on their enterprise so that their employees can order, pre-order food at lunchtime so that they don't have to go and stand in line. Um, it could touch, it could handle CUI, but the way that they have implemented it into their network, they, they do a zero trust environment for it so that the product cannot. Um, but if you were to look at it and you were to do an, you know, an assessor came in without knowing about it, you would look at it and say, oh, that's a problem. We need to peel the onion back and look and say, start off the things with, does this company have the critical thinking of a version of an ATO process to put software on their network? Well, actually they do. They have a very robust testing procedure. They have a very robust um, risk reduction strategy procedure that they, they limit to what it can, can touch. Um, so we, not every answer will be yes or no. It really, a lot of this is going to depend on getting in there with the assessor, with the company and seeing how they actually uh, uh, apply the controls and the rigor and the critical thinking skills that they have. Um, we don't want this to be something that's arbitrary though, because it needs to be standard. Um, so there is a lot of rigor and coming back and looking at things um, and you know, the, the, VoIP, the VoIP issue has been brought up several times. Um, we have had people come and say, you know, what if I'm not using Microsoft 365, is that acceptable? Yes, there are other options um, without a doubt, but it's, I hate to say it's gonna be each one is different, but every company is unique. And what we really need to ensure is that the assessors have a repertoire and an understanding. That's why we're putting them through the training rigors and the testing rigors. And we've created the capability that if a you contract with an assessor to come out and perform your audit and you disagree with the results, that we took time to consider that and how we would put that into um, gosh, dispute resolution um, and make it fair, but also make it in you know, a timely manner so that contractors aren't held back from business. So not every answer is a yes or a no, it's gotta be the cumulative of, okay, are there critical thinking skills here? Um, so long, long answer, I wish I could make it easier. Good answer, critical thinking. I think that's where the maturity aspect comes in, right? I think that's what elevates that above being just sort of a, a list of technical requirements that you need to meet or not meet is you have that idea of have you, you know, it's talked about is in terms of institutionalizing, but it brings that whole idea of critical thinking skills that you mentioned into, into play, right? 
yep. the process for doing it. So last week on this um, series, uh, Stacey Boschanek joined us. So we're real thankful for her uh, time. And, and she provided a lot of detail on the pilot program that's underway. It's pretty exciting as far as you know how that's progressing along. Um, so I have a question for those contractors that are not associated with one of those pilot programs that want to be first on their block. So we hear this from a lot of companies. Right? I don't have a mandate. It's not in my contracts. I'm not in the pilots but I want it. I want to be out front because I've made the investment and I want to get credit for that from my customers, from the government, et cetera. What's the, what's the fastest path to certification for those folks that are not in the pilot? How soon could those companies realistically expect to get certified? So there are 15 pilot programs. So there's a lot of contractors out there that will hit. We'll get 1,500 at a minimum certified this year. Um, the gate the gating factor is how fast we can get the cyber third-party auditing organizations, the C3PAOs, um, audited uh, by DIBCAC. So that'll be the gating factor. Um, if, it, now, and this is not if, it's when. When we get a CPA, bleh, C3PAO certified, the assessors that have been through the training come and they link their license to the C3PAO to, so that when they conduct the audit and they bring it in, the C3PAO is actually the one that provides the stamp of approval. So getting those C3PAOs, uh, CMMC3 certified, um, it was a little bit of a, a cart before the horse. So it took a minute for us to figure this out. Um, not, a, not a minute. I mean, we had our ideas, but so the DIBCAC team is actually out right now conducting audits on those C3PAOs. Um, you would think that they all would be ready to do their three level three certification. Um, a few of them had poems that they needed to close. We're not changing the rules for the C3PAOs. They're in rules that apply to industry. So getting them to close the poems have been the, you know, the, the gating factor. Um, so as soon as they're there, and we're, we're assuming we'll have three in March, we're in the process of evaluating three of them um, that can bring on assessors. Understand this, um, generally for a CMMC3, it's more than one assessor. Okay, so it's a team and you have to have, you know, more than one person come in. So just take that, you know, I would say uh, mid early summer, um, it should be to the place where people outside the pilots can get their certs um, as we ramp up. Uh, the AB uh, is having another town hall um, and I think it's February 23rd. Don't quote me on that, but I'm fairly certain on that. Um, and as we get more, um, and they're also doing another training session right now, they're underway. Um, they've hired professional staff. They're on their way. Um, I believe they'll have their CEO in place and their FSO in place by the end of February, first week of March. So that volunteer effort is coming to, you know, it's waning down and now they're bringing on the professional staff as they had always planned to do. So Long answer again uh, is I would look to be early summer outside the pilots to have an assessor near you geographically um, that can come in and do the assessments, especially if you're only looking for a level one cert. Uh, level three is a little bit more complicated. Cool. That's, yeah, that's soon and kind of consistent with what we've been hearing. So that's, that's good. Uh, the other end of the spectrum, this is an audience question. They're asking, you know, when will the requirement of passing an audit start to become pretty much not an option if you don't want to impact your business. When do you foresee the audits being conducted on the majority of primes? So I guess, what's the farther end of that? So the beginning is this summer, what's the farther end when it becomes sort of the standard? So we have that slide out there. Oh, I can't remember how long, where we did the, you know, how we did the rollout and we scaled out the self, the spurs, that self-assessment, you know, shrinking and the amount of um, CMMC assessments growing. I believe that with the cross-pollinization of our, our supply base, that in 2023, we'll hit the tipping point. We have until 2025, but I firmly believe, but by 2023, we'll be a good portion through it. Um, and we'll already be rolling in other federal partners. So 
that's Katie Arrington. You know, I, I just see that being the year that we hit the tipping point. We have more certified than we don't. So here's an audience question about um, maybe are the primes sort of overdue and over pushing this, right? So um, the question is, you know, large primes are telling their supply chains they must get level three with no regard for the data. Um, one prime told a COTS, you know, COTS company they had to get level three. Um, that obviously generates cost that those, those contractors may incur. They're going to try to pass that through as a, you know, as a, as an allowable cost. It, it, are you concerned that maybe there are some folks out there that are sort of overdoing that? Now, I, I will caveat by saying we've had some large primes on this series that are going the other way. They're examining their supply chain in detail saying, let's minimize the number that need to have CUI and, and shrink that. But there are some out there that are saying, look, we don't want to take any chances. You go get level three. And that's how we know everything's good to go. So it's a really gonna, conservative approach, but it's it may drive some overspending. Well, I'm going to help cure that, or the department is going to help cure that, right? So what will be in RFPs and market surveys and RFIs are the um, in sections L and M. You see the contractor shall, right? We are actually helping our PMs learn to look at each one of those requirements and determine what level of security is needed per requirement. So if I'm only saying that needs a level one, it's gonna be hard pressed for the prime to tell the sub that's doing that work they need a level three. So we're, we're helping that. Um, and you can see a lot of that in the uh, five, the DOD, Department of Defense instruction on the DAU, uh, Defense Acquisition University website under the Adaptive Acquisition Framework, AAF. If you click on that website and you go to the um, AAF and look at the policy and guidance, you'll see uh, something called the 5000.90. That's how we're helping the, the, the PMs and the cores understand what kind of security would be needed on particular programs. Um, not on all programs, I'm sorry, not particular. The second thing I want to say to that though, is think about your company's instantiation. Are you working on multiple contracts? And are you working for multiple customers that the combination of that data on your network it may be you know, that it, it doesn't qualify as CUI by itself, but when you compile it with the 10 other programs you're working on, are you firewalling all of that off? Or does it all live within your network, your enterprise? And even though it may not be classified CUI, the compilation is what makes it CUI. So, I would say you really have to start looking at what you, you have, what you're doing, um, all of that with um, your business. I also wouldn't let the prime, you know, um, I would say validate the need because ultimately it's going to raise our collective bid, right? So, you, and that's part of teaming, right? That's part of negotiations. Like if you want me to get a three, that means my rate is going to be higher. Are we going to be competitive? And what does that do to our P win? So, I mean, there's got to be discussions um, and don't be afraid to have them. I mean, that's the thing that, that you know, bothers me the most is, oh, I don't want to ask my prime. You should be talking to your prime. It should be part of your negotiations. You know, if they're a mentor protege or you have, you know, I, I, I used to, when I was back in the day, a contractor, you know, I'll let you be a sub on my work, right? And I'm the prime and where you're the prime, I'm the sub. And maybe it's better for that relationship, that teaming, you know, cross pollinization that we're both level three, but you have to have those discussions and realism, right? We know how much we can pay for CMMC levels. So we're not gonna pay more in a contract just because the prime has required it and said, I want that sub to be, you know, I want everyone to be level three. Well, how are you gonna justify that rate when you put the bid in? And if we're saying it only needs one and your rate comes in in a three, you're gonna lower your P win. It's business. There you go. So and 
we a lot of this is back to i mean if, if some people may hate me some people may love me but a lot of this is based on business basics so one of the, a lot of the questions we get now that the sort of fundamentals of how cmc works are, are getting out there and getting understood is is how how do we you know how do we get compliant what things work what things don't work and you know there's a lot i'm sure with the pathfinder exercises that you've done and the, the pilot contracts that are happening now a lot of great lessons come out of that right some things that may you may use internally to help you sort of refine the assessment guides and that kind of thing but is there any intention to release any of those lessons learned you know anonymous sanitized but release that out to the public so we can see here's some things that work really well maybe some things that don't right now there's some you know there's some examples in the standard right about you know, practical real world examples in there. Um, but I'm thinking about it as people are trying to think about, you know, how to make choices around things like scoping and segmentation and those kind of things. You know, they have to come up with a logic. They have to convince the assessor that they've done that right. Some guys I, I think would be good there. I So I absolutely, um, let me look at that. That's a very good idea. I, I, whoever brought that up about lessons learned that we've had, I will check with the team to see if they can put something out about um, some of the pathfinders. I mean, I know lessons learned that we've had mm -hmm. uh, and internally, but let me see what we can do. That's a very good idea. Whoever came up with that, I'm, I'm all for it. It's very transparent what lessons we've learned um, and how we can do that. So yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Um, th so there's this, I don't, I don't know exactly where this came from. This kind of crossed my radar in, in some conversations, but sort of a hint that there might need to be some relaxing or some changing of requirements, maybe as some of those lessons learned. Is that anything that you've seen? I mean, have you seen anything from those early experiences that would indicate, man, maybe we wrote this a little wrong or too strict and we might have to loosen it, or maybe the other way. Are you seeing things that people are taking latitude with and maybe doing it in a much more open way than you had intended and therefore you might tighten the requirement. Is there anything like that floating around at this point? Well, that example that I started with about those apps running on an environment, right? Mm -hmm. yep. That's what he's learned. I mean, that's sitting down and talking to industry and going, oh, okay, got it. Because it's about the critical thinking. Yet again, it's not about checking the box. So if you have a, a documented uh, process on how you vet the software that you bring into your environment. Um, you build risk reduction strategies, zero trust around it. That was one of those lessons learned. Um, another lesson learned uh, was about the companies and the cage codes. So um, we have cage code families, right? Um, so, and I use it all the time, but Lockheed Martin has a bunch of different cage codes because they have different business units that have cage codes. Specifically, when you're talking about the very, uh, I would say, uh, critical technologies where, you know, the, the SAP environment comes into play. So those networks aren't the same as everything else. They're, you know, they're air gap, they're off the net, they're, they're completely different. Um, Taking that and the CMMC and saying, you know, your CMMC, what I didn't want to do in the very beginning. So if you look at CMMI, right? So I, uh, as a business owner, I took my company from zero to level three CMMI, three or four. Um, but it was program specific. And the CMMC, we want to be company wide. Well, we realized pretty early on that there were certain things that just weren't, you know, Lockheed Martin is going to be a three for normal. And then there'll be particular cage codes, particular instances where they'll need a level four or a level five. Um, that was a, a learning curve, right? Because we'd say, oh, well, they, they'd all be, you know, rated at a five. It's like, no, that, that, that environment will never make it to a five. It's only this environment, lesson learned. I mean, we've, we've been doing that the whole time we've been developing it. Um, so I would say the pilots and the pathfinders have led to a lot of discussions uh, between industry and us. And um, I think as the, the adjudication period comes to an end on the model itself, which we should have done at the end of February, and then we put it into coordination for the interagency coordinates and 
coordination. Uh, the final rule going into effect in June, I, I would say June timeframe, May, June. Um, I think we'll see some definite changing on level four and five. I, I definitely see that. I do not see much in the way of changing levels one through three, um, especially since the NIST 172 has officially been released. I don't think you're gonna see any uh, movement on that. And once again, it's about critical thinking, but I think level four and five, we really need to take, we had all intentions of uh, coming back. So we have meetings with CIO and with industry to talk about that. But I, as far as all the other levels, nah, they are what they are. They're not too hard. They're the things that you've been required to do since 2015. Well, so audience question, I'll, I'll slip in here, but I'm gonna resist the urge to answer for you. Should companies wait and see if these things are gonna change or get backed off in some way? So yep. <laughs> I think you just answered it. They're, they're, these are already requirements. There's not much difference between what's already required. And that is the part that, you know, I think industry struggles with the most, right, is we are not asking you to do anything that we haven't asked you to do previously. In fact, you've been t attesting to the government, you're doing it. So now it's trust but verify. But we also understand it's, it's something that may have, you know, uh, not slipped between the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the the what is it slip between the, the the slats or whatever um we definitely have to have an, a, a continued conversation about it but no get ready now it's all been out there you've been required to do it don't wait and if you think waiting somehow benefits your company you're dead wrong <laughs> the adversary is busy they've been busy <laughs> The longer you wait, the more they get. Um, we've said this from the beginning, and, and I appreciate you guys always giving me an opportunity to talk. But, you know, and I cannot say it enough. This is 50% 50 50 about for protecting the national defense. And it's 50% about you protecting your own company, your employees, your IP, your data. Um, it's, it really is don't wait. Everything you need is out there to look at, know just the biggest thing that I can tell people in preparation for any of these discussions about CMMC is you really need to have your CFO in the room, your COO in your room, your IT department, and I would absolutely bring in your operators, people that are actually on the networks, right? The IT team gets confused because everyone assumes there's a cyber people. Not the case. They're like, but they're not exact. And these are going to be serious discussions about how you position your company for the long term, your strategic goals. There's, if there's going to be resourcing needing, needed, you need the CFO, the COO. You know, they need to be able to converse with the board or the bank, however they need to do it. So this is really needs to be a collaborative discussion about your business and the, the capability that you're enduring, that you're not just gonna be a, a one hit wonder, lightning in a bottle. So I wanna, I wanna work at just one more question and then uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a close out. 30 minutes goes by, goes by fast. So another question on the how is, you know, folks are asking a lot about making confident choices on their purchase of third party services. So cloud services, managed services. And a lot of times this question takes the form of, if I buy solution XYZ, will that be CMMC compliant? And we know, you know, there's more to it than the, the vendor's credentials because how you configure and use the solution matters, but consumers are looking for some confidence. So far we've seen some of the major vendors putting out cheat sheets that show us how to configure and use their services in a compliant manner, which is great, but those are still just vendor claims, right? There's been no, there's been no vetting of those. So is there a path to having those things vetted is it as simple as the service provider goes and gets CMMC certified or are there other things in play in terms of bringing, you know, reliable, here's a secure solution. If you choose this and you use it in this way, it's compliant. So I will tell you, I've heard from two CSPs that are FedRAMP high certified, two of them. They shall rename nameless because any 
any cloud service provider that's fed ramp moderate to high, you're, you're good. What they have done though, is they have asked for the C3PAOs to actually audit them, the cloud, the cloud service provider and their product suite. So if they say this product suite, if you do all the steps in CMMC level one and two, our product suite meets these requirements in level three, they're having it tested. So I applaud that. That's that's a huge step forward to say that I've got a C3PAO ver validation that this is compliant. Um, the other thing I would look at um, for your own business sake is, um, where they have ATOs, where they're being used. It's great. One thing to be FedRAMP certified, look at where they're being used and, and the tools within there. Um, you know, there's more than, you know, AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google. There are a lot of options out there, folks. Um, you need to make the best decision based on your business need and do your due diligence. But no, absolutely. Um, I, I'm seeing more and more CSPs come up and you know, these are the packages that you can buy. Um, I also like that because then for me, one of the, you know, there's, I don't like to get locked in, right? I like, you know, at blank as a service contracts. I think that pushes industry to keep innovation going. So I hope that they all come along with some sort of CMMC as a service and then that, that continually evolves and changes. Um, and once the adversary knows, you know, what you're using, this is the, and the, the other thing, and I know we're over on time, but um, we really have to get back to what I talked about in the very, very beginning of all of this is the first rule of Fight Club is don't talk about Fight Club, right? Don't make it easier for the adversary to know how to go at you. So if you put out on your website that you're CMMC2, that you're you know, a proud sponsor of X, Y, and Z product, it doesn't take much to figure out what you're not doing and to go at you that way. So I want, I still you know, put this in people to think about it before you do it. I can't stop you from doing anything, but I would just highly recommend, you know, I am CMMC certified. You don't need to tell what, what level, let that be part of your teaming agreements um, and NDAs so that you can keep the adversary out of the way uh, to some degree. Um, and if you're going to align yourself with a product, I wouldn't put that out on your website or something like that, because if there is a, something happens, God forbid, um, and there's a vulnerability, the adversary will know exactly who to, who to go to, to, you know, penetrate and, and take advantage of that. So those are just my words of wisdom. You know, it's less is more. <laughs> so not sticking with less is more, I'm going to run us over another minute or two by asking a closeout question. Um, on the call, we've got contractors, vendors, service providers. Um, you've been hearing feedback, for concerns, suggestions, et cetera, from the div for, for the whole time now. What's your number one suggestion as you watch what we're doing and how we're going about it? What's your suggestion on how we all can do it better and achieve better results? So, and I'm going to say, I'm going to go back to um, this statement. You know, we're, we're really focused about, you know, and I'm reading through the comments, right? I'm on Jim Fair and Aaron's and Brendan's. I'm going through them. Anonymous, they, they are going through. Um, Hi, MJ. I'm sorry. MJ Thomas is on and, and MJ is one of my, my dear compadres back from when she was FBI. Um, I really want you guys to get off the focus of CUI, right? I really want you to stop there. And I want you to think, what is it that you need for your company to be in an, an, an enduring capability, right? Stop focusing on CUI or not CUI, because yes, the government can define it as CUI, so can the prime, right? They can say, we want this to be CUI. There's the culmination of data in your, your enterprise that becomes CUI. What I really want you to think and, and to position yourself is, 
where do I see myself in five years, right? You know, you dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Look at what the security precautions and controls you're employing today. And think to yourself, five years from now, what will I need to have in place? Because acquisition takes a long time, procurement, buying new data systems, buying new services. How am I going to get from where I am today to where I want to be? We do these things, you know, we have offsites all the time in the department where we, we think about our mission goals. And I really think as a company, you need to sit back and think, what is our mission goal about cybersecurity? Is it to meet the minimum requirement or is it to be best positioned to function, to, to operate in a cyber contested environment? And you need to make that decision. It may be, you know, that some companies, when you walk into their lobbies, it's, they very much invest into the aesthetics of where they have their employees work. Um, they may, um, invest highly in making sure that they have, you know, very high end name brand coffee in the break rooms and that they find that that's where their best investments are put. You can go into companies where it's a nice place to walk in. It's a comfortable place to work. It may be the mid-grade coffee, but they put a lot of money into making sure that their information is protected and their employees are. I think we have to come to that realization. And I think that's where a lot of company needs to be. Stop worrying so much about what CUI is and, and where it is. You need to think about your company's business model. What is your mission statement? What is the goal you are trying to create? What is it you want your business to be known for? And at the core, you know, um, for most companies, I believe it's to be a good and trusted partner in national defense. So if that's the case, you probably are gonna look at a level three. You're probably gonna see that as an investment. But from where I sit, um, and, and this is just my personal opinion, mean, you know, not the Department of Defense, Katie Arrington. I would much rather see companies invest in themselves in securing their employees, their IP, their data, than um, you know, making sure that there's a foosball table in the break room when people aren't even working in buildings anymore. Know what I mean? Good advice, Katie. Thank you. And thanks uh, for joining us today. Thanks for the audience for, for joining us and, and, and allowing the clock to run a little bit over. Um, I would say, please uh, join us for future town hall sessions. Our, our next session is gonna be a week from today, Wednesday, February 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll have Richard Wakeman from Microsoft who's gonna help untangle your questions about the Microsoft Cloud and CMC. Should be very interesting. And uh, if you don't have an invitation or don't have that on your calendar, please go to our website, neosystemscorp.com for details and registration. Thanks, everybody. Ed, can I add one last second? Yeah, go. So uh, one thing I want to say to everybody, and I know a lot of people have already logged off, um, CMMC is one piece of a much larger effort. Um, I've been talking about CMMC for two years. Um, Y'all are going to start hearing me change my trajectory. Um, I am moving to supply chain risk now that I've got cyber solidified to some degree. We're moving out on that. Now I really need to work with industry and academia about what risk looks like and helping us all identify risk. Um, so if we're level set and we understand cyber, that you understand the, the, the standard that I need you to be at, and we have that common lexicon of, of understanding, what else is there? And that's where you're gonna start hearing my conversations starting to go because supply chains need to start understanding risk and it's not just cyber. So um, looking forward to the next year, I think 21 is gonna be a hootenanny. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, the 20 just plain up sucked. Um, there's no other way around it. 21, I think, is going to be the year where you start seeing all the pieces of the puzzle coming together to create, um, you know, what I call the, the, the wheel of, of, of death, right? We want to make sure that we're, we're capturing everything we can. So look forward to chatting with you again. I love the fact that you've given me an opportunity every Wednesday um, that, that I could possibly fit into my schedule. 
Thank you for putting these events on. Ed, you are a wonderful partner in crime. Thank you so much. Um, and no, we don't mean legit partner in crime. And I know there are some people out there like, oh my gosh, she's admitted it publicly. She's committing a crime. No, I mean that. In yeah, so I try hard to stay out of jail. That's. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you for always uh, uh, jamming in there and, and getting me uh, on these events. So other than that, take care, everyone. God bless.